You guys, Mike, the situation is here. Can you believe? Indeed. I can't believe. You can believe because this is you're on a press tour. You're talking. You're promoting your book. I can't believe because this is bringing me back. Oh my gosh! Stop it. Crazy. Yes, yeah, turned 15 minutes of fame into 15 years. Good for you. Yeah. We were talking about your coffee order because my listeners know I love to know everything. So you walked into this tall cup of coffee. Had to know how you drink it. Yeah. It's with almond milk. Yes, almond milk, cold brew. Um, venti, yes. Usually I'm trying to fast. Usually I'm trying to diet. Gym tan laundry is we're still always, there. Always there. We're always there. Yeah. Um, but that was a really good question you asked me when I first walked in. You were like, You used to be so crazy. You're you yeah. know, this recovery. Now you're at- drinking almond milk? Yeah. Now you're yeah. Drinking- I'm like, yeah, listen, you know, it's the it's the personality. It's an all or nothing. And now I'm this amazing father, this amazing employee for Viacom. Um, you know, just trying to kill the game in every aspect because I have that obsessive personality, you know. But many, many years ago, and one of the reasons why we're here promoting the book, um, I was a, I was a maniac, and I was on the, you know op- what I was else on the opposite you were? side of the spectrum. You know what else you were, and you know, getting into that nostalgic state of mind really brought me back. You were like conniving. You were like schemy. 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 You were schemy. I, I, yeah. But it was so good for reality TV. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, you're not like that anymore, but like you would talk to the girls about the boy. Like you could yeah. play both sides in a yeah. way where like you were so loved by your castmates. Yes. But then like we would get the tea behind the back yeah. and you would kind of spill it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people don't know before the show, I actually, uh, I was a drug dealer and that was my job. Yeah. You were a drug dealer before I, the show? Yeah, I was good at it, too. But you weren't really doing drugs majorly until the show, I thought. No, no, no. Um, right before the show, I had just gotten out of rehab, um, which most people uh, don't know. And I never really revealed it until, you know, just dropping this book recently. Um, so casting didn't know either? No, no. I didn't really want to tell anybody. I mean, you're going on a show, you're partying, and you're you're going to tell the casting person, yeah, hey, I just got out of rehab. <laughs> They're gonna be like, oh my god, we we got a problem right, here. Right, right. You know, we got They we wouldn't want that responsibility. Probably, they probably next. I mean, you do get a psyche val yeah. when you do these shows, but I'm sure the red flags would have been. Yeah, they wouldn't have taken you know, that. But it's yeah. it's smart that you were so young, but you kind of knew that sharing yeah. that yeah would prevent you probably from going on the show. Probably, but the the first season, I only I only drank. Um, Wait, so you got out of rehab for what drug at the time? For pills, oxycodone, Xanax, Valium. I just, um, I used to be like a pharmacy, you know, I used to sell prescriptions. How were you drugs. getting these drugs? Um, I used to have friends in Brooklyn, Staten Island. We used to get uh, or find people that had prescription pads. We'd figure out how to write them. And uh, TID, next thing you know, a TID means three times a day. And now you got 90 uh, Roxy, Roxy sets. And uh, you got to have the, I guess, the balls to go into the, um, into the, the, the pharmacy and uh, roll the dice which a number of times I, I did for months and months and months, but eventually there was a, uh, a close call. Like where they would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Who are you? You don't, no, you're for, not a- for, for months, this, this particular caper was working. Um, and then eventually, um, I went into uh, a pharmacy, uh, myself and my cousin, which is in my book. And we dropped off a prescription for, you know, 90 oxycodone, 30 milligrams, uh, a piece. So we had two prescriptions. I went next door to get a slice of pizza and within five minutes, the whole parking lot was full of uh, cops. So what'd you do? Run away? No, no, no. I couldn't because as, as soon as I saw the, the flashing lights, they walked in the pizza place um, because I guess uh, it, you're in the complex. You know, the pizza place was right next to the uh, pharmacy. And um, they had my, cus- my cousin arrested outside over a cop car. And they were looking for the the I guess the other assailant I guess or the other yeah you know part and, and it, which was me, and um, I ended up escaping that day uh, because um, I walked out and I said I don't know what you're talking about I was just getting a slice of pizza, and my cousin who had um, was in handcuffs he was like oh my god that's my cousin right there he came with me, and uh, I'm like I don't know what he's ta- I don't know what he's talking about but I ended up escaping the law that day but we all. Might now I didn't escape the law for right. for too long because I ended up going to prison many many years later uh, 
in uh, 2018. Usually when people, I mean, the stories that we know for people that didn't experience drug addiction, usually it's people that struggled at home. Like, what were you escaping from that you wanted to be on drugs at such a young age? I wasn't escaping anything. I was just always trying to push the envelopes of of everything. I, I kind of liked the the way that it made me feel when I took a Percocet. So I kind of... But kinda, isn't it just like, doesn't it just like numb you? I mean, it works different on, on everyone. Yeah. Everyone's bodies differently. But I, I like the way that it felt. And uh, that first Percocet, when I tried it when I was 19, I kind of, to be honest with you, fell in love with the opiates. Everybody has a drug of choice, I guess, to a certain extent when they're experimenting and growing up, which I did. And eventually, uh, with the lack of knowledge of self, which I, I, I didn't I didn't have at the time, I had an obsessive personality. So once mm. I gave myself that drug, I wanted more and more and more and more. Um, and I started to learn more about myself once I became famous and I had the millions of dollars. I always wanted more. I wanted more more money, more cars, more attention, yeah. more do win, they say, women, everything. In rehab, do they say that like an addictive personality is a thing? Yes. That's a thing. It's a thing, yeah. Okay. It's a thing, yeah. So that's, that's what you would say is your... That's well, what yeah, led you down I, this road. I'm the, like you get into things and you're all in. Yeah, I'm never gonna change that person. I still got it, you know. Um, but but if, towards healthy things. Yes. Now. Well, eventually, I figured it out through trial and error, and obviously uh, going through recovery uh, four times. I did. I went to rehab four times. Um, I adapted the principles of recovery, the 12 steps, the serenity prayer, the sponsor, the recovery network. I did it all because I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. I mean, my best thinking had led me to rehab four times and I'm like, I gotta try something different. So that's when I was like, I was desperate to be like, okay, I gotta do something that work. Most people, they fail in in this area, you know, of in addiction, the, the odds are against you. A lot of people tragically, they, they don't right. make it. They, uh, they're in jails, institution and, and death. Uh, and so I desperately put all hands on deck and used my obsessive personality to redirect what I was doing in life to everything positive for days at a time, weeks at a time, months at a time, years at a time, yeah. until eventually I turned around and had years of sobriety and I totally changed my entire life. And then the phone starts ringing, the people wanna employ you, people wanna be around you, how did you do it? Um, it was really you know, one day at a time. So many docs came out and like, just more information about like oxycodone. And yeah. Stuff. Did you watch the? Does that I trick, have. Yeah. Like no, the painkiller. One hundred percent. Movie. Yeah. Or show. It's a wild ass drug. Oh, like they yeah. killed so many people. Do you look back like, how did I survive? One hundred percent. Um. Like, um. When I read my book. I can't even believe that I'm still sitting in this in this on the sofa right now talking to you. Yeah. Because the amount of things and and the stories in there could have taken my life many times. Right. I feel that God has spared my story so that I'm able to um, tell um, my story to help others. Are you a sponsor? How does that work when you are in recovery? Do you then become somebody's? Sponsored, um, I, 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 I have not sponsored anybody yet. It's a little tricky when you're on TV and, and sponsor people. Uh, uh, but, but, um, did people know you in rehab? Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. As soon as you walk in and it's just like, oh, there's the Jersey Shore guy oh my or gosh. there's the situation or can I take a photo photo? So wherever I went for many years, even when I was trying to seek recovery and trying to get better, there was always somebody snapping photos, always someone pointing the finger. But and at least there wasn't I, social media like as much, right? Like, well, maybe, and uh, well, social media came out in uh, 2009. So, and you know, that's when Instagram came out and Twitter and things like that around 09 and 10. So my whole recovery, you know, has been, under a microscope. So no matter where I go, I get a cup of coffee. I understand that there's probably going to be a photo taken most likely. Did that make it harder to get sober? If you think about it, maybe it made things better because mm. if you know, if you know there's a camera everywhere you go. Right. And if you make a bad decision or if you uh, do something that's, that's, that's not kosher, I guess, uh, it might be on TMZ or, right. or you know, you know, you're not going to do it. So maybe it, it held me, to, held my feet to the fire. So to right. Speak. 
And Lauren was with you through how much of this? Like you're uh, high school sweethearts. Yeah, no, we're college sweethearts. College. We went out um, in college for about four years. And, and then I went to rehab. I got out of rehab and uh, Lauren was, you know, she was following her dreams in, in the fashion world and she was doing her thing. And I didn't want her to be the girl that got away. And she kind of inspired me. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go for my dreams, which is TV. Okay, that was your dream? My dream was always TV. Really? Yeah. My, what did my, you think you were going to do on TV? Um, I thought I was going to be on like a Calvin Klein uh, um, campaign at least. My abs were just so ripped up. Like, <laughs> they were just so ripped you up. You were like, these abs need yeah. to be photographed. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Um, and oddly enough, my first year in TV, I was offered a Calvin Klein campaign. Um, and they offered me $50,000. And my team countered with 500,000. So I, I I mean, this is kind of funny, but I guess you guys can can understand that we weren't able to find a happy medium there. Yeah. <laughs> as, as Calvin Klein was offering 50,000 and my team is like, well, you know, you're talking to the situation. One of the biggest reality stars on the scene right now, our counter offer is 500,000. In hindsight. Right. In hindsight. Yeah. Now that, you know, it's many years later, I'm sober. Um, I, I should have taken it. Yeah, the sometimes you do things for the... The resume. Right. For the resume. Because it's a brand An that, accolade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should have done it for the resume, for the accolade, but I got a really cool story behind me turning them down. But I thought that my abs were so ripped up that I could at <laughs> least get the Calvin Klein campaign and follow in Marky Mark or oh, Mark Wahlberg's... Oh, he was your idol. Yeah, he was. So I was trying to follow in his footsteps, which, like I said, I did get offered the campaign... Uh, and, but when I got, so that was a dream. So how do you, was. how do you, how do you explain how like do you, turning how do you, it down? Yeah. Do, Marky Mark. That yeah, was your dream. Yeah. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I was, you're listening, Calvin Klein, the abs are still abbing. Yes. Yes. Um, I was so wild and crazy that, you know, when I first, my first year or two in the business, I was the GQ man of the year, uh, in 2010, along with, you know, Drake and a few other people. I mean, if 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 one endorsement was being presented, another one was coming yeah. right around the pike. So it was like, okay, I guess that didn't work out. You know, what about Lamborghini? Lamborghini offered to do a situation Lamborghini. And I was like, oh my God, I love Lamborghini. That's like, crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> let's let's do this. And my team countered with, we would like two Lamborghinis. Okay, good team though. I mean, <laughs> you know they're putting saying? you up high. But but that's but that's but like I said, obviously we weren't able to um, find the happy medium there. But those are the two that I you remember. Still think about. I still think about that. I should have took the situation Lamborghini, and I should have taken the Calvin Klein campaign. Um, but again, at the time, I was really really high all the time for many many years straight with hundreds of pills in my pocket and it's I'm lucky wild, to be here though Mike because you say in your book that like your family didn't know you were really good at hiding it how good like that I, I mean they they had an idea but no one was able to catch me red-handed the, the the writing was on the wall same thing happened with like the networks and the production companies and the, you know everyone um the behavior was so erratic right. and unstable and wild. You can point it out and say, like, there's a problem there, you know? Or there's a situation, you know, pun intended. But um, but they, they, they weren't – and no one was able to catch me red-handed with the pills in the pocket. Or a lot of the times if people were about to frisk me, I caught you before you frisked me. And I'm like, yo, I'm about to call the lawyer. Are you sure you want to do that? You know what I'm saying? Wow. So, like, I was a, a brazen young kid. Uh, doing all the wrong things. And then eventually that behavior, I'm not promoting it, eventually led me to prison. So, right. you know, I'm lucky to be here telling my story. Right. Um, and uh, but it's 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 quite a tale. And today to remind everybody, you're married. Eight years sober. Two kids. One on the way. Yes. Eight years sober. Eight years sober. Yeah. So we're very happy for you. Yo, yes, yes. And um, and it shows, yeah. you know. How are you working out and, like, doing all the things that you were I doing know. at the time with so many? I can't – I wake up after a glass of wine and I can't move, you know. Uh, I always think about that, like – I was just always in really good shape. And I would uh, pretty much build my body up for a few months. And mm -hmm. then it would just get destroyed uh, or whatever. And, like, youth kept me going. 
Um, nowadays, I, I really don't put anything bad in my body. I, 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 I will admit I love diet soda. I love diet coke. I had a feeling. I, love, I was like, really, not even like a diet coke. I, I know now these days, yeah. like my wife is like, you know, you're like, if I have a bad day, like, yeah, like a, a bad day, which is rare. Um, I have a diet soda, maybe some Doritos or something, maybe some snacks. Damn, maybe you, I'll, maybe I'll cheat you on. wild. I, I, listen, <laughs> you oh, wild. yo, a real man cheats on his diet, not his woman. I love that. I love that. And again, props to Lauren because I remember when we met her on on Jersey Shore, it was like, who is this sweet angel? Yes. Like right away, I angel. feel like she got into everybody's hearts. Yep. Everyone was seeing you guys on TV doing the wild shit that you do. And then in walks this like angelic, yeah. Yeah. just like kind, pure hearted human. And you're like, Lauren, what are you doing? Yep. <laughs> like, what are you doing in this house though? Get out of there. Get out, run. She didn't. She stuck no, around. Yeah, she was the college sweetheart. She's the angel. You know, she saved my life um, more than once. Um, and I'm, like I said, I've, I'm lucky to, to be here right now talking to you. Um, you know, there's a few times she saved my so life. So you said you were together in college. Yeah. Then and then I tried. She was going to her passion. You were going to your passion. And I tried to get back with her, and she's like, "Okay, you want to get back? You, you're rebuilding your life. Okay, um, what's happening?" And I'm like, "Well, I just got presented with this uh, offer from MTV to be on this reality show." And she's like, "What's the name of it?" Well, it's untitled right now, but um, what do you think? And she's like, "I'm not going to be that girl that is home." while her boyfriend's on some reality show cheating on her and calling me on the phone. And she said no to me. And she was 100% right. Not that I would have done that, but re relationships don't work on reality TV yeah. unless they, they have a, like a stable foundation. Right. So I went to Jersey Shore and because my at the time my girlfriend, she wouldn't get back with me. And she went to fashion school and, and did her thing. How did they approach you? How did they find you, MTV, at the time? Uh, at the time, um, I was uh, a drug dealer and a stripper. Good combo, right? Right. Wait, did the stripper thing just come out now in your book? Or were um, you open about it before? I was uh, not as open as I am with the book. Yeah. You know what I mean? I kind of really... Um, I really wrote this book and was raw and filtered because I was like, my life has been a reality TV show for the past 15 years. If I write a book and people are going to be entertained and love it, I really got to tell them a story that they don't know. Right. So I really went into everything that everybody did. Every know. detail. Yeah. Okay. So you were a drug dealer and a stripper. Yeah. Drug dealer and a stripper. And, um, to make money, I'm assuming the stripping for, to yes. get drugs too. Um, no, I was a, I was a good, I was a pretty good drug dealer. I had money and then I was also stripping because I, I kind of loved women and, and I was in really amazing shape and I just thought it was like a win-win situation. Like a strip club in San Island? No, it was uh mail review. What is that? You don't know what mail review is? No, am I supposed to? Mail review. Am I supposed to subscribe? Do you know what mail, no, you don't know what mail review is? <laughs> mail review is where they do, um... Uh, right before the club opens up at, let's just say, 11, maybe from uh, um, 8 to 11, they do the mail review, which is the guys are, are stripping and ser they're serving drinks mm. uh, for the girls. And usually they do that before the, the club opens. Like, yeah. uh, like in, in Jersey. clubs that... Club Abyss in Jersey. Club Abyss in what? Jersey. Yeah. So you were going out in Jersey. Uh-huh. So were you staying at the Jersey Shore? Like, did I, that speak to you before the show? Yeah, yeah. Jersey Shore was my spot. Oh, was okay. My stopping grounds. And um, I remember uh, because Lauren went down uh, the, the road of uh, fashion school or whatever, and she was following her dreams. She inspired me to, in, to go after my dreams. I'm like, I'm not going to be the only one, like, left behind here. You know, so as Lauren's doing fashion school and, and, and doing internships for Ferragamo and all these other things, I was like, OK, so I'm going to uh, stop drug dealing, which I did. And I um, I was just in really amazing shape. And it, it, it prompted me to send a number of half naked photos <laughs> Uh, to um, fitness and underwear agencies in New York City. Uh huh. Okay. Within about three days' time, I got like yeses from a bunch of them. Now these guys are probably like you know like J.C. Penny catalog type of uh, caliber, but for me, I felt like I was on the right path. Right. And I didn't have to look over my shoulder anymore and drug deal. Right. You can make money from it. 
Ex exactly. So as I was going to go sees in New York City for about three months, I bumped into a flyer that said the hottest uh, guidos and guidettes in the tri-state area go to Harris in Atlantic City uh, with the, for a TV show. And I was like, that's me. Were you calling yourself a Guido at the time? I wasn't, because technically a Guido is a, der a derogatory right. uh, slang towards right. an Italian. But so were you using it towards other people? Did I you know, consider no. yourself one? No, no. I just thought like at the time that when, when people were saying Guidos and Guidettes, that they weren't Italian. Uh -huh. Maybe, you know what I mean? Maybe it was an Irish guy that was running the, the flyer or yeah. something. You so know? it didn't offend you. It, it didn't offend, it didn't me. offend no, you. No, no. Um, so then you go to Harris. I go, I go to oh Harris. Oh my God. What would die to be at Harris that day and see a convention? Yes. It was it, a convention was a, of all Jersey Shore type. It was the hottest Guidos and Guidettes <laughs> in the tri state area. Could you Every, everybody was hot. Everybody was wow. good looking. Everybody tan. was tan, naked, greased up, wow, probably on wow. GHB fist pumping. Do you remember seeing your castmates that eventually were chosen that day? Um, not on that day, but I used to hang out with uh, Sammy. Oh, so uh, you knew Sammy I before. I knew Sammy before the show, and I also knew Angelina before the show. You did? I did know them, too, before the show. Good um, terms? Like, friendly? Because um, you turned on Angelina. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> no, there was no uh, loyalty there. Okay, Sam, uh, she used to hang out with the same people that I did, like a crew. So we were in the same crew. Really? Right. Um, but it was almost like high and by. You know mm. what I mean? But we went out together all the time. That's crazy. Okay. Now, Angelina, on the other hand. Angelina. On the other hand, technically, before the show, we kind of dated a few times, kind of a few times, which they do reveal on this new season of Jersey Show Family Vacation, which it kind of just comes out because I have the book and I'm kind of like full disclosure and they kind of find out that we kind of hooked up a couple times before the show. How did you keep it a secret all these years? I don't know. I really didn't like her when it the but how didn't first she, started. But how didn't she? Um, when, the, when the show first started, um, we didn't want the casting producers to know that we either knew each other or kind of dated. You thought that would hurt. Thought that would hurt the chances of Aww. being on a show Damn. that was like uh, anonymous Single. or something. You know? uh, like, oh, all these people in the house and everybody doesn't know each other. Uh, Meanwhile, like, I know Angelina. I know Sam. Like, I knew a few people. Oh, yeah. smart. Damn. Yeah. You guys thought of everything. Okay, so you go to this convention do you think, because you had confidence, right? You're like, yeah. I'm ripped, I'm in for this. Yeah. Did you think that you had a chance? Um, I definitely thought I was a chance. My my uh, my abs were so ripped up. They looked like <laughs> in, they looked like implants. <laughs> they did. They looked, there were uh, eight of that? Yeah. Like how many? Yeah, it was eight? A, I, I just had an eight pack and I could eight usually pack. just um, eat whatever I want. And like, it was just, I attributed it to good genetics. Yeah. But I also worked out hard as well. Yeah. Um, But I was the, the first one uh, picked. First really? one casted. Uh, for the pilot in 2008, um, there were uh, two others besides myself casted for the pilot. It was greenlit because um, VH1 had it first. And then once, because uh, Viacom owns uh, VH1 and MTV, eventually uh, MTV took it from uh, VH1 and then they grabbed uh, some of the other cast, uh, maybe from other shows uh, or where, you know, everyone, they did some more castings. And it ended up being the cast that we know. Yeah, it ended up today. being the casting that you know. Snooki, Wow, DJ Polly D, Ronnie, Sammy, the sweetest bitch you'll ever meet, Angelina, uh, and eventually Dina comes in uh, a, season, a season or two later. And we learn and what Vinny. DTL means. Yes. Then gym tanning laundry. Yes. The gym thing. All of you were really going to the gym that much? A hundred percent, yeah. Uh, and I the mean, laundry thing. How much were you doing laundry? I mean, technically, you know, if you don't go to the gym, you're not jacked. If you don't go, if you don't go tanning, you're pale. And if you don't do your laundry, you don't have anything to wear. So gym tan <laughs> laundry is a way of life. It still is to this day. Do you think you, did you make it up? Um, it was, I, it was made up by myself and by uh, Polly in the living room. Um, I have like court, I have like these court documents. <laughs> Wait, did you copyright I, it? I, I tried to, uh, 
um, a trademark, trade, it. Yeah, I tried yeah. to trademark it. And then Viacom came in and was like, wait a second, not so fast. Uh, uh, because uh, I was an employee of the t at the time, mm -hmm. which is understandable. Right. When, when the, when the judgment came down where they're like, listen, it was, it was originated by you and Polly in the living room. Yeah. Jim tanning laundry, but it was done under the watch of, uh, you're an M MTV but employee. Do so they I, want it? Like, do they? I, I was allowed to use it. Oh, you're allowed to use it, but not trademark. At, it. at the, well, it, you can trademark it, and you're allowed to allowed to use it. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it, it like I believe that they owned it at the time. Maybe not anymore. But Do you yeah. did you trademark the situation? I did. Yes. So it's that's yours. Yeah, that was done beforehand because that was done around the casting time. Oh, you did it? That You did went through the process then? Yeah, because when I came in for the first casting at MTV and I told them my nickname was um, The Situation, uh, the producer was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Like, <laughs> do you have that trademarked? And as a young kid, you're like, uh, yeah, I have a trademark. <laughs> but actually, you, you don't have a trademark. Right. Once I got out of the room, I'm yeah. like, uh, can we get a lawyer? I need to trademark something. So you did it. Yeah, I trademarked. Oh my god, I, I trademarked it around the casting time, so it was before I went on the Smart. show. Smart. Yeah, because he would have been in the same pickle with yes. the situation if yes. you didn't do it. Exactly. And did you add it officially to your name in any other capacity? It's not on my birth certificate okay. yet, yet. Yeah. <laughs> Is it on driver's license? No, but it was on my court documents, which I thought was very funny by the government, which was funny. That is funny. Yeah. Oh, my God. Very that is wild. Yeah. You also came up with, I think, DTF. Yes. Yes. Which we all use. Yes. It's not we all use down to fuck. Smushing. That that was made up on the show. Smushing. I don't know if Snooki made that up. I think Snooki made smushing up. That's like hooking um, up. Yeah. Well, more than hooking up. Oh, that's yeah. like having sex. Yeah. All oh, right. Smushing. Yeah. And grenade was you. Most likely. <laughs> yeah. Most likely. I, I, I reluctantly have to say most likely yes. Because that, listen. Today, that wouldn't fly. It definitely, wouldn't, wouldn't, fly. It definitely yeah. wouldn't fly today. But it was just a thing in the culture at the time. Um, that was just a thing. Yeah. And, and everybody was saying it, like girls and guys. Yeah, right. You know, everybody was doing it. And it's just, we were very open, very raw, very uh, authentic. A every single one of the cast, that's why it was super successful and still to this day. So, still to this day. Yeah. Speaking of that, like, do you, th would the show be able to work today like it was then? Oh, God. I mean, it would definitely make a big splash. Right. I mean, to the point where it's like, it's what they call um, like a disruptor, like a show that like disrupts things. Yeah. Like to the point where it makes changes. So if, if, if our show, which started in 2009, which was a cultural phenomenon, record ratings, um, if it came out in uh, 2024, it could, like I said, it would definitely be a disruptor. Yeah. Uh, a game changer. Like, it would definitely would cause I mean, it was a change. game changer then. Like, everyone knew you. Yeah. You became mega celebs. Yeah. Leo DiCaprio comes up to you at a club. GTL all day. And he said that to you. <laughs> yeah. Were you shocked? Or were you so, like, you're jaded I, then? I, you're, like, riding the wave. But at the same time, Leo's, like, Leo's, like, the actor of actors. Like, right. He's, he's, like. He's Leo. He's the dude. You're, you like, you're I mean? watching? You're, like, he's the dude. Every, like, he's been the dude for, like, Right, decades. he has been the dude. Yeah, same with The Rock. Like, they're, like, they've been the dude for a while. Um, but when they said it, we were just, like, yo, like, damn, like, it's it was surreal for sure. You know what I mean? Obama mentioned uh, me on the, um, I think it's the inauguration address, that the situation, Snooki and Wow are exempt from the tanning tax. <laughs> that was an address to the country. Oh, that's wild. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. wild. That's legendary that's right legendary. there. And 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 again, to 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 have your start as a, a reality TV star, um, and have the president mention you, right. Leo, The Rock. Um, I was uh, like I said, GQ Man of the Year in 2010. Um, all these things, like we were definitely making big waves, like making changes in entertainment because nobody wanted to even consider a reality star anybody. Like they didn't even want to be around reality stars, like, you know, like at an award show or anywhere. They just like, oh, you're a reality star? Like, oh, God. Like, but even now, and also you guys were special because there weren't 100 reality shows. Yeah. You know, it was like the real world. Like there were reality shows, yeah. but. Now it's so 
we're so inundated with so many of them yes. that doubtful yes. that Leo is like, hey, yes, facts, you know, facts. <laughs> one of uh, yeah. the housewives. You talk a lot about money in the book and about how the money made you, you know. It was gasoline on the fire. I mean, right. you know, it, when you read the book that I was already a crazy kid, mm -hmm. you know, and then once you gave me the millions. But millions, then, you were making millions, oh, from, oh. but not from the get. No, from the from the from the get from like the first season from, from the jump, yeah, season one, yeah. You, I put in in uh, the book that we were making a couple thousand, and again, I have the records, I have the receipts, I can go pull up the contract right now. Um, it was a couple thousand bucks, uh, plus we made um alcohol money from the the shore store. You know what I'm saying? Which was and like they a, paid like, for your outings. I'm assuming no, when you went to the club. No, the the hundred and twenty five dollars a week that we made from the shore store helped pay for the shots. Wow. At the club. Things are different now. Yeah. You know what I mean? But back then at the first season. So when um, did the money start rolling in? Second like season. Second season already they realized like. Second season. Everyone negotiated. Second season. um, Everything was renegotiated. Um, They handed us contracts and said like sign here on the dotted line. Uh, and I looked at the contract and it was the same as the first season. And I was like, oh, damn, I'm like, I'm like, uh, no, I, I kind of knew what we had filmed uh, in season one. The show was just only, was like a shooting star at the time. Yeah. Um, every talk show at night we were on. And then I was just like, what happens if we don't sign? And they're like, well, we're going to replace you. And I at the time, which is like a make or break moment, I was like, OK, good luck. And I walked out. And then a couple of weeks later, you got like a million dollar raise. Did you have a lawyer at the time, an agent, a manager? I, I, I did, I did, but they, the, we were we were called to to a meeting. Like, oh my god, congratulations, you got season two or whatever. No one thought that they were gonna hand us contracts. And once we got the contracts, we were like, oh damn! Like everybody had like deer in headlights. Like everybody's looking at each other. Like, what do we do here? Um, and I knew, I don't know. Must have been maybe there was an angel on my shoulder intuition that had told me that we had filmed a groundbreaking cultural phenomenon and um and, and in that moment i walked out of the room and uh, about a month later we got a uh, million dollar raise that's wild yeah were you all making the same everybody made different but there was like a couple contracts that were mirrored it's crazy, you guys, because this is an, an important lesson, too, for anybody anywhere. Know like, your worth. Know your worth. Nobody's yeah. going to hand you anything if you don't ask yeah. for it. Yeah. You know? Because they rather yeah. pay less, you know, 100%. for the good yeah. stuff. Yeah, don't blame them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, They'll try. Yeah. If they can't get it. It's how it is. Yeah. yeah. It's don't how blame. it is. Yeah. Um, would you let your kids ever watch the show? I would probably wait till they are, like... Like, way older. Like, s hopefully... S 18 hopefully yeah i mean i'm sure they'll try to watch it when they're 16 every every generation i i it's like clockwork they all watch it all the, it's I, true. All, all the high school kids they watch it the next generation of high school i think kids who watch was it. on charlie d'amelio you know charlie d'amelio the yeah. tiktoker yeah. she's super young she's like yeah. 20 she was on my show and i remember i don't even think one of the family vacations was on at the time but i was like what's your favorite show do you watch property that she's like you know what Who's her boyfriend? Landon Barker. She's like, we're so into Jersey Shore right now. Yeah. And it's just wild how yeah. these things in it, culture. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the generations, like when they're in high school, they watch it. And then four years later, another generation watches it. And you're like, oh, my God, it's like it's like almost like timeless. Uh, I, I don't want to say timeless train wreck, but it kind of it's kind of just kids just being really authentic. We're, we're living, working and uh, partying. I feel so grateful that I was. Like watching it in real time. Oh, you know, yeah. I'm I'm 35. I was like watching it as it was. Ha yeah. I was in that culture, fuckers. Yeah. So you're watching it now. I lived it. Okay, <laughs> we lived it with them. Um. So I know you did a lot of the shit on the show. You're not proud of, and you're a different man today. Yes. Any biggest regrets from the show that you still I mean, think about? I mean, there's always going to be. I mean, you have to think about it. Do you really have regrets if you turn your L's? into lessons, right? If you use everything. Are the L's loss? What are the L's? An L would be a loss. Oh, okay. You turn an L, I was like yeah. a loser, <laughs> a but, loss. But if you, because if you watch any of those movies about time travel and you go back and you change something, hmm. then you kind of change the future. 
And right now I am a, an amazing father of two babies with one on the way. I have eight years of sobriety. Um, I was just nominated for multiple people's choice awards. Like I'm back at the top of my field, like living my best life and teaching right. others to do the same. Would I change anything? Right. It's also like a game of Jenga. Yeah. It's like if you take out one piece. Yeah. Will it all yeah, end up the same? Exactly. Yeah. But again, I did slam my head into a cement wall in Italy, which definitely hurt a lot, <laughs> which caused me to get a sprained neck and a concussion. Um, that wasn't the best decision at yeah. the time. Um, also, you know, again, not filing my taxes in 2011, which was a decision that had caused, or actually it was like 2010, but which had caused to, to me to eventually go to prison many, many years later. That decision, right, of me on my couch. That moment that you describe in, in the book. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like, but, I told my husband about it, and I was like, you have to listen to ha the moment. I'm like chilling on Christmas Eve, on Christmas Eve, you know what we'll I mean? We'll get him. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like living my best life. I just made five million bucks. Uh, I'm like, you know, Obama just mentioned me. I got a Ferrari outside. My brother's like my manager. He's like, uh, you just made five million bucks. You're going to have to file. And I was like, damn. And then he's like, but, you know, maybe you, you'll get them next year. And then I was just like, we'll get them next year. But because you want to know why? Because the year before. I didn't have to file because I didn't make any money. I was a drug dealer. You know what I'm saying? You, I, on the you, you know what I'm anything. saying? So you think, you think, oh wow, no one's gonna notice. No one, you know, you know that mean. No one's gonna notice. <laughs> no, no one's, one's gonna, gonna know. Notice. No one's gonna know. No, yeah, yeah. They're but, gonna know. They're gonna know. Yeah. And eventually, like clockwork, after three years, like clockwork, they came calling. They came. Knocking. The next year, though, did you pay, or were you every year saying that same thing? Um, I think for those three years of making all those millions, um, it wasn't done correctly. Just let's just say that. Just wasn't. Do you blame your brother at all? Not at all, because if you think about, he was your ma manager. He was his manager, but he was tr at the same time trying to fight for my life. I was a kid that was running around. Um, you know, when we'd land for a city for an appearance, and and, and at the airport, they'd be like, "Where'd Mike go?" Like, how do you lose one of the most famous people in the country? Like, he, he just ran away. Like, I would go and cop drugs from the drug dealer when I would land in a specific city. And they'd be like, oh, my God, how do you lose the situation? He's got bright blue head, Ed Hardy pants on. How does that happen? <laughs> yeah, he's and not a, and, 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 like, rosary beads and a backwards cap. How does that happen? Um, I was just a really wild kid. Um but yeah, no, the taxes were not done properly and getting back to having checks and balances and being mature. If you have checks and balances, you have to make sure to check and balance. If you're the boss, mm -hmm. those your name is on the account no matter what. If I wasn't guilty, the judge wouldn't have been able to send me to prison. But at the end of the day, the evidence that they had was like, okay, your name's on the account and it wasn't done properly. Yeah. You're going to prison for eight months. So you didn't have anything like, who do I blame for this? No, who no. Because like, you took accountability. All the, like. wor all the work that I've done on myself with, you know, therapy, anger management, and recovery led me to having the utmost of accountability in every aspect of your life. Your life is a product of your decisions. If you are upset at any particular time about anything, go to the mirror and ask the person in the mirror to make some changes. Yeah. How were the castmates at that time? Who who would you say was most supportive of you? At what particular time? Like when you were going through when the I was recovering with it? when with prison and everything. Oh, they all were. They all rallied around. Yeah. Me. They all did. They all visited me in prison. They they saw that I was doing the right thing. They were like, "Oh, Mike's turning over a new leaf. Like mm. he really is doing the right thing. He's three years sober, speaking at high schools, speaking at colleges, working on the side." at rehabs, helping people in need. And like when you see somebody doing the right thing uh, and walking it the way that they talk it, it's like inspiring. And I thought my friends like rallied around me and I, I'm forever grateful for their support for sure. Who are you closest with from the cast? I am closest with all of them, to be honest with you. We have this like, I'm, I'm not going to say secret group chat, but we have this group chat that we speak every day about everything, everything from like politics to. And everyone's on it? 
Well, not everyone. Most, most, of the, <laughs> most, most. It's not on the group chat. <laughs> there, there are multiple group chats. Um, but the good one. That's what I'm. The secret one is where you want to be, huh? Um, there is, there is some group chat. There, there is one with everyone. You know, S S Sam's in it. Angelina's in it. It's like a whole cast thing. I, I'm sure maybe you know maybe Ronnie will get back in it shortly. But um, then there's an MVP one. Mike, Vinny, and Polly. Oh, love that. Yes. Is yeah. it Mike, Vinny, and Polly? And that's not the secret one? No. Oh. No. Then there's the other one, which is like Vinny, uh, J Wow, Polly, Snooky, Tina, myself. I think that's it. Who's missing? Oh, yeah, so it's, it's the OGs. Yes, yes. Yeah, pretty much the OGs, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing that you guys stayed so close Wait, for all these years. Uh, Polly, uh, Vinny, uh, Ronnie, they were best men at my wedding. Um, you know, we really are that close. And you're saying you hope Ronnie comes back because right now he's not well, really the, talking to you guys? Yeah, th this season, y'all see. This is his season. Yeah. Oh, what did you think of his whole relationship with Jen? Oh, that, that was wild. That was wild. Yeah, that was like... Um, you were worried for him. Yeah. You know, you, you saw on TMZ, like... She was like running him over or something, and there was a lot of crazy runs. Yeah, it was probably some of the 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 craziest stuff that you'll see. Yeah. What about when he dated Malika? Oh, I don't know too much about you that. Don't? I, I heard. I that. like that. I, I, I watched that I, show. What was that show? Um, um uh, like uh, celebrity. Uh, oh, which they one were on that? some dating show together. What was it called? Famous. Like, yes. Single. They were had a moment. It was Th cute. Yes, that's what it was. It was a moment. I don't know too much about it. Mm -hmm. I know it was a quick moment, but then I knew that with him and Jen, they were just so. I mean, I'm gonna toxic just, is the word. Toxic is the word. It's calling a spade a spade. They were super toxic. The TMZ headlines were legendary savage. Like, and were you guys rallying around him through that? Or we would try to talk to him, but he wasn't listening. He wasn't. Was yeah? There. He was shutting he you out. He wasn't there. I mean, he's listening now though. He is. Yeah. And you're saying we have a lot to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, you guys have a lot to look forward to for February 8th. So when you talk about money in the book and stuff, you talk about how, you know, you let it you let it kind of rule your life for a moment. But also, which is a lesson to everybody, and I hope that most people know it now, that money isn't everything. Oh, yes, yes, and, yes, um, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't yes. mean that you're happy. Like you said, some oh, of my yes. hardest times is when I had. Oh, yes. When yes. I got all this money. Yeah, I had an epiphany uh, in 2011. I was a multimillionaire. I had, you know, many, like two Ferraris, Lamborghini, a Porsche, and an M5 in my driveway. Like, you know, on one of the biggest TV shows in the country. I was uh, roasting the uh, Donald Trump at the time on Comedy Central. Not my, not my finest appearance that day because I was super high and they handed me the um, uh, the jokes and I didn't even look at it. I was just like, I was just so high on myself and, and just on drugs. I took the the material and usually, you know, you read it, right. you, 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 you practice it, tone, delivery, like, you know, in order to be successful because you're going to be in front of millions of people in probably an hour or two. Um, but I just think you care. winged it. I just think I winged it. I didn't care. I winged it. Um, they were paying me six figures to show up. I was flown out on a on a on a Trump private jet, um, and uh, I remember, like in the Trump uh, towers, the night after the roast, which the first time I've gotten some booze in my career at the time, which is a a, a learned experience, I guess, a learning experience. Um, Everyone loved me afterwards. Uh, Trump give me hugs like, you know, you did a great job. Don't worry about it. You know, um, I just felt empty, not because of like the booze, not at all. I just felt empty because like I just had so many people pulling me in so many different directions. And I realized I'm like, I, I'm a multimillionaire. Like I'm on the biggest TV show in the country and I'm not happy. What, what the hell's happening right now? Um, and then I, I thought to myself, when was the last time that I was really happy? And the last time that I was happy was in college, dating the love of my life and having the love of a good woman. And that's when I made the decision to seek out what was important in life. And uh, I wouldn't bunk into my soulmate for a few years, but that was the, um, the sentiment at the time. I did call Lauren. I did call Lauren in Trump Towers. 
Um, when you had that epiphany. And when I had that epiphany and I tried to woo her back, I, you know, br please leave the, your man that you're with right now. Um, almost like the old school um, Drake. Um, um, what was that song where he's trying to, his old school song, uh, M Marvin's Room. Where he's trying to like woo back the ex girlfriend or whatever it is, y'all research it after this. You'll laugh. Anyway, um, she didn't. She didn't take the bait. She picked up the phone. She realized like what it was. Tried to talk me off the ledge, and then that was it. And then she hung up and changed her number. Changed her number. She changed her number because she she was almost engaged at the time. Wow. And, and her man was like, "Yo, like you better change your number," like, you know. So how did you end up getting her back if she many, was almost engaged? Many years later, uh, not many years later, about two years later, um, I heard that she went to uh, a kickboxing um, gym at 8 p.m. and uh, on a on a Tuesday night and the Wednesday night, I went to the same kickboxing same time and she happened to be there. We locked eyes and it was like we never lost time. She was having issues at the time with whoever she was with. She left him and then she's been with me ever since. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank God for that. Yeah, she, sa she saved my life. And it looks like even though you went through so much and with the show and the money and the drugs and the fame, you still had her like in your heart. Mm -hmm. Like yep. you hadn't completely moved on from a hundred percent from that. A hundred percent. And look at you now. Yes. Look yes. At you know, um, I also know that her brother is passing. Yeah. That was a very tough from an overdose. Yes. In uh, 2013. Was that a turning point for you? At the time I was deep in addiction. Um, and I was in Spain. I had just been, subpoenaed by the US government that they uh, were having an investigation on me. And it was just the worst time of my life. Like I, I, I had, I went to the airport and I was going to Spain and there was eight D, not DEA, but uh, IRS mm. agents with the windbreakers at <laughs> my, at my gate. There's like seven of them. Like I'm like some, uh, you know, fugitive. like I'm John Wayne and like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like something crazy. And that was like the moment I was like, wow, like this is a this is a really big problem. And uh, they handed the the grand jury, uh, you know, subpoenas that you're being investigated or whoever it was. And then when I got to Spain a, a couple of days later, I get the phone call that uh, Lauren's, um, you know, Lauren's brother had passed. And I was the last one to speak to him. The you were friends? Yes, I was very close with Lauren's family. Um, Did you know what he was going through? He was in a sober house, sober house at the time, and uh, he was cut recovering from uh, opiates, or and or more so could be heroin, heroin as well. And Lauren called me, and she's like, um, "I can't get a hold of my brother. He looks up to you. I'm sure if you call, he'll pick up." Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm in Spain. I'm kind of going through my own issues, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the, the phone call. So I call. He picks up. And I'm like, Chris, man, you're, uh, what are you doing, man? Your family's looking for you. Please call them. Let them know you're okay. And that's it. He's like, all right, no problem, Mike. He call, He hung up the phone with me, called his family. I'm okay. And then hung up with them. And the next morning, uh, he didn't wake up. Wow. So it was a really, really tough moment. And, and that's why um, a lot of the work I do in recovery, um, the speaking engagements in colleges and high schools, I do, uh, you know, um, honor honor his memory. You know. What do you say to these college and high school students about drugs? Like, don't do with them. Never try anything. Do, like, how do you? No. What, uh, what's it, the message? You, the message is you really tell your story. You're just honest. Mm. And if they're able to take something from your story, and they're able to learn from some of your lessons mm -hmm. and how you recovered. And um, a lot of the times that's that's how it's done. That's, and, that's... And, and how I did it was through um, the principles of recovery, the 12 steps, mm. the serenity prayer, uh, having a sponsor and things like that. Um, the one day at a time, never giving up on yourself. The comeback is greater than the setback um, and things like that. So, Wow. You guys, Mike's new memoir, Reality Check, Making the Best Out of the Situation. Take a moment. How I Overcame Addiction, Loss, and Prison. 
is out. Everybody should read it. It is just so much info, so much tea that you didn't know about. You really lay everything out there. Like no secrets are are left. No. It's, you know, if you pick up this book, I, I guarantee you'll finish it in either one sitting, uh, one day, two days. Um, it's a book you can't put down. Um, you're going to laugh. You're going to cry. Um, you're going to be shocked, inspired. But at the same time, I, this book's also going to save, you know, millions of lives because it's getting out everywhere. And uh, I think on January 2nd, my team is here. We're we're already discussing making it into a screenplay in a movie right now. So. Wow. Well, the book's only been out for a couple of weeks. So uh, everybody's loving it. Friends, family, peers, uh, people in the industry. So uh, we're, we're going to push this into a movie and uh, probably a documentary as well. Love and can't wait. And thank God you wrote it. I know, right? I know. Yeah, it took about two years to write it. It took two years. I was going to ask you how long it took. It took about two years to yeah. write it, but also eight years to be even in the position to write. I'm eight years sober. So right. if I wasn't sober and doing the right things, I wouldn't be in the position to to write a uh, You think a, like at the five-year mark, you wouldn't have been able to, you think you really needed, you needed all that time? I wanted to write something around the five, five or six-year mark, and I started to approach people and I've been. I was asking my team around. I, I'm not, around six years. I asked, like, "Yo, we should write a book." And I, I'll be honest with you. I think um, some of the big publishers they took the phone calls, but I think they passed. To be honest with you, y'all shouldn't have passed. Those are the best stories, though. Y'all shouldn't have passed on that. Look at me now. You look, y'all shouldn't have passed. Look pa at me now. Yeah, y'all yeah. shouldn't have passed on that because everybody's talking about it now. They're going to make it into a movie. It's been all over the press for weeks now. It's going to be a bestseller. Um, yes. And look at me now. And look at you now. Mm -hmm. Well, may you just keep on rising up, <laughs> Mike, the situation. How are the abs doing? Oh, the abs are, are, are one of my goals for 2024. <laughs> yeah. Along with the uh, along with the bestseller book and uh, I mean movie and docu. But uh, yes, that is my next my next thing is uh, reveal the situation in 2024 movie docu and I want to do some sober houses and help some people. Amazing. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Yeah. Amazing interview.